turn your eyes upon Jesus. In your hymn books, there is a song, 290. I don't know about you, but while she was playing it, I was singing it. And I just feel inspired this morning that we, we maybe need to sing this song because there's somebody here, maybe me, who really needs the, the words of this song. Let's sing it together. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Wanted to sing that because in my life right now, as a pastor in the Seventh day Adventist Church, where you are sitting in the Santa Clarita Seventh-day Adventist Church, I am thinking and praying for the leadership of the world church right now. Because I am praying that God will reveal His will to them as they are thinking about how to lead us. And that they would do whatever it is that He wants done. Now, Something that I sent to a friend of mine, another pastor friend of mine this week, uh, kind of goes along with what we're talking about today, and that is uh, the way in which you do what you do shows what you believe. The way in which you do what you do shows what you believe. So you could say that the way in which you treat people shows what you actually believe. talking with numbers of friends and relatives about what it means to be a, a, an Adventist in a world where uh, uh, so many people don't even know God, what it means to be a, a believing Christian. Even this morning I was talking with Vijay, there's a problem that we have in the Christian church today that is we say something like, I believe in Jesus. We say something like, I'm a follower of Jesus. And then all week long, we act like we're not. And I'm not saying that we do it deliberately. I know I don't do it deliberately. But there are kind of rules of engagement, let's call them that, that are the rules that we play by in society. And so basically, I'm, I'm going to poke you right now because I certainly feel poked by the Holy Spirit to say, you know, maybe the rules that we play by in society aren't the rules of the kingdom of God. You feel bad because maybe you don't make enough money. You've got to ask yourself, who said? Who said you don't make enough money? You feel bad because your car uh, is, is a 2002 VW Beetle. Sorry, love. <laughs> she gave it to me this year. It's my car now. And I'm loving it. Even when the turbo doesn't work. I'm loving it. Who said that I need a 2000? You know, who said? We've got to ask ourselves in this time, in this place, in this thing that we call being a disciple of Christ, we've got to ask ourselves, 
why we do what we do. And then we've also got to look at how we do what we do. Because as Bob Goff, who was the, the author of this statement that I sent to a friend, said this week, what you do with your relationships, and I'm paraphrasing, what you do with your relationships shows what you actually believe. So, as I said to VJ this morning, if, if there's not a connect between what you say you are and what you say you believe and how you treat people and how you do your life, there's this disconnect and people from the outside who say, oh, I'm not a Christian. I don't even believe in God. They look in on us and they see us in our society. They're, they're our workmates. They're, our, uh, they're the person at the gas pump. They could be the person in front who's on their cell phone at the stoplight. Don't you love those people? You're in a hurry. And you want to lay on the horn. I have. I've tooted a few people. Yeah, oh, that's poor choice of words, I know. But yeah, I've honked the horn at some people. Better. Yeah. And I could have just waited. There was this lady this week. She was being very, very cautious because there were people crossing in the crossing lane. She was so cautious I had to wait until the light turned green again. How we treat people in our daily lives shows what we believe, if, if, if Bob Goff is right. So I'm, I'm happy to tell you that, that for the next little bit, we'll have the opportunity to, to study what the Bible says, what Jesus has laid down for us in his example about what it means to live missionally what it means to live incarnationally. Now, these are big words. Mission and incarnation, these are the two words that we need to remember. But when we put them as an adverb, it's missionally and incarnationally. Our text this morning uh, starts with... Uh, it, it, John 1, verse 14, is, is so important because it talks about how Jesus came into the world. And this is, this is the whole big piece that has to do with incarnation. Now, let's remember, uh, those of you who speak, uh, let's see, Spanish, is the word in, what is the word for flesh in Tagalog? Does it sound anything like carne? No, probably not. Uh, La pan. Okay, uh, okay. It's, it's good. He, he can tell you. But those of you who speak Spanish, you already know half of the word because this word is Latin. We, we, in English, we get the word carnal from this word, flesh, fleshly. In Spanish, carne, when you ask for chili con carne, you know that there's going to be some kind of mystery meat in the chili. Oh, and by the way, uh, <clears throat> I believe... I believe it's a vegetarian chili that we need, right, for the chili cook-off? Sorry, I, I know that the, the meat chilies usually always win, okay? But you're going to have to be creative this year and, and do, a, do a vegetarian chili at the chili cook-off. Carne means meat, flesh. So we have two words here that we need to unpack today. One is missional and the other is incarnation or in flesh meant. So that's why the John 4, 1, 4, 14 text is so important as we look at the fact that God comes and he incarnates. Now, there, there's a lot of talk right now, I'll just have you know, even in Adventist circles, about how to understand God as a, the Trinity. Be it known to you that in the history of the Adventist church there were some, and it would seem there are some today who have a problem with the idea of the Trinity. 
Please come talk to me if you do. Let's talk about it. But God chooses, all I'm going to say to you today is, God chooses a method of coming and getting in contact with human society. And the methodology that he chooses is to become one of us. Now, about, I believe it's about the year 300, there was a big church meeting and they decided once and for all that Jesus was 100% God and 100% human. So that is the, the, we could say that's the traditional, that is the decided Christian belief. Because you see, there are various Christian sects that have come along in the past that have said, oh no, he's only God and he's masquerading as a human being. Or there are those that say he's only human, he's masquerading as God. So they settled it, or at least they tried to. They settled it by saying he's 100% God and 100% man at the same time. This, this, I believe, is the time when we can honestly use the word mystery. We don't know how Mary got pregnant by the Holy Spirit. We don't know how that happened. So it's a mystery. And I believe that it is okay for us to let God be God and realize that we're just us. Is that okay? Because I, I, we, we, and, and, and thank you for saying amen. But here is the difficulty is that there are many people in your lives and in my life who are not comfortable with believing something that they cannot prove themselves. So be aware that people who do not want to make that leap of faith are in your life. And, and so therefore, it, it's going to be difficult maybe to talk to them about uh, what you believe because you have faith in a God who manifested himself, we believe, as a human being in the form of Jesus born in Bethlehem to a mom who had not yet had relations with her husband when she became pregnant. We know this in the story because Joseph was about to send her back to her parents in disgrace because she was found to be with child before she was married. He didn't do it. So the angel had to come to Joseph as well and say, look, don't send her back to her parents. The, the child that is going to be born to Mary is of God. Do you think Joseph understood that? He didn't. He too had to have faith. He too had to play along. And I'm only going over this because this is what the John... John 1 verse 14 talks about that God came and he chose this method to, to communicate with his humankind, with his human creatures. And that is what we need to really grab a hold of as a concept of the incarnation, is that the goal, the goal that God had by sending Jesus was not only to save us, because in order to save us, he had to first communicate with us about himself. Really glad that that day came when Philip, one of Jesus' disciples, said to him what? Show us the Father. We want to know what God really looks like. And Jesus said back to him what? If you've seen me... You've seen the Father. This is the Trinity, and I'm using that word specifically. This is our, you know, whatever you conceive of as God of creation. That's what I'm going to call him because Revelation 14:7 calls him the God of creation. The God of creation chooses to communicate with his creatures, creator, creatures, bridge that gap with incarnation. That's his methodology. So I know, this, I know this maybe 
a little heavy in some respects to, to really grab a hold of, but that's the concept that I want you to grab a hold of. If, if you are going to try and communicate with even another human being and you don't know their language, you know that you need an interpreter. You need somebody else who speaks the language in order to take what comes out of your mouth, interpret it, and put it into the language of the other person. God had an infinitely greater job because he is infinitely greater than we are. He is indescribable. Don't we sing that? Indescribable. We, we cannot conceive of God. And he knows that. So when he took the people of Israel out of Egypt, how did he, how did he represent himself? Anyone? Pillar of cloud. Some of us know the word Shekinah. This cloud, remember when they were at the, dead, the, 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 the Red Sea, they're up against it, here come the Egyptians. What does this pillar of cloud do? Moves around, here's the Red Sea, moves around to the rear and goes black on the other side and lights up real bright on their side so they have a light to cross the Red Sea. And it's nighttime for the Egyptians. Pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. What do you need in the desert? Come on, you desert dwelling people. What do you need in the daytime? Shade. What do you need at nighttime? A heater. What do people have out in their backyards? These gas heater things so that you can sit outside in the cool evening, put on a little sweater, and then have some nice heat coming at you that's not fire when it's not fire season. God provides this. He says, this is what represents me. I will take care of you in the desert. I'll be a pillar of fire because you don't, you, you are not capable. You are not capable of conceiving of me in my entirety, in everything that I am. You, you cannot so that's why he says in the second commandment in Exodus, you will not make any graven... You will not think in your mind, oh, this is what God looks like. This is what he looks like. We're going to make an image of him and then we're going to worship that image. This is why I said, you cannot contain me. We, see, we have the phrase today, you can't put me in a box. So be careful, Adventist family. We accuse other Christians, we accuse other non-Christians of putting God in a box by limiting him. I say there's a lot of our thinking sometimes that limits God. And we are guilty at that moment of putting God in in a box. He said, I'm a pillar of cloud. You cannot describe that because you cannot fully describe me. He says, I'm going to come to you as a man. Last night, I, I reminded us uh, in, in our discussion time that ever since Eve said, oh, look, I had a boy. Must be the one must be the Messiah. God promised that he would send a man, a boy child. So, yep, when, when Adam and Eve got pregnant outside of the Garden of Eden and she produced a boy and not a girl, she's like, yeah, we're going back to Eden. That's why she called him Cain. Cain. The interpretation of Cain means, I have acquired. I have acquired. Meaning, I got what I needed so that I can get back to Eden. Incarnation. God said, I'm going to send, I'm going to send a man. So what does it mean to live missionally, to live incarnationally. 
We're going to unpack some of that in the weeks to come, but I wanted to, to just outline a few points right now concerning what I believe it is to live missionally. First of all, we choose to be a follower of Jesus. That's a major choice right there. Because it means, A, I believe in God. B, I believe that Jesus is God and that he is the representation of God incarnate and that he has asked me to follow him and to believe in him and to do what he asks me to do. And I decide to be a follower of Jesus. That's huge. But in accepting him as your leader... You also then accept the mission that he sends us on. Does that that follow? Does that work for you? Okay. Uh, Those of you who have served in the military, those of you who know the military, know about chain chain of command. And so if you are in that organization, you have chain of command and you do what you are told... We understand that, that, that that's a choice. Sorry, it's a choice to join the military. I do not know why that's making those noises, so we'll just keep going. Um, understand that the same thing exists when you say yes to Jesus, the incarnate God on earth. That you are saying, you are now my leader. What you say goes in my life. Now, you're saying, Pastor, I, I, I know this. I understand this. Uh, good. What if I had to say uh, that that's the struggle that we all have? That we know that this is the case, but that all week long, all day long, 24-7, there are other voices, there are other people, there are other systems that are trying to pull us away from following God and are trying to say, no, You should be your own God. You should make the decisions as to what you do. You should be the one to set the agenda for your life. And that still small voice, that Holy Spirit comes back to you and says, no, no, you said that you're a follower of God and he'd like you to go this way. Those are the choice points that we have every day, all day, Jesus sets the agenda. I would say that that missional living is also called kingdom, kingdom living in the here and now. Okay? And that we have to have a willingness, we have to have a willingness not only to search out, this is scripture study, this is, this is you know, t- talking together, this is praying together, we have to search out what it is that God is calling us to do. And then not doubt it when, when we do hear the call, because that's the next thing that usually happens, not doubt the fact that God is calling each and every one of his disciples, every single person that says yes to him, he empowers to go on a mission for him. So let's, let's just understand that, that when we say the word missional, that at least that's what I'm that's what I'm meaning. So then if we if we bring up the word incarnational again, we realize again that it is it is God's strategy. It is his it is his methodology of how to get the mission done. Okay? So if 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 you want to know how God wants us to do the mission that he sends us on and you're, and, and, and you're interested because you love Jesus, because you're thankful to Jesus, you're interested in how he wants you to do the mission that he wants you to do. Remember we talked earlier about the how and how How you treat people shows what you actually believe. So if you actually believe that Jesus is God and that Jesus is your Savior, that Jesus is your leader, you're going to be interested in how how he wants you to do the mission that he wants you to do. Does that make sense? The mission 
strategy that God uses is enfleshment, is incarnation. This is difficult because you see, uh, Jesus, Jesus comes from somewhere else. But then again, when you meet a stranger, you, you look like you're coming from somewhere else too. Jesus comes from somewhere else and he comes to help us solve a problem. So in order for us to accept what he does for us, he has to show us that he is one of us, like us. That's why he chooses incarnation. He doesn't want to, to scare us. He doesn't want to, to overawe us. The rules of engagement in the great controversy that many of us understand just a little bit say that God had to play by the rules of engagement in the great controversy. Let me ask you a question, some of you Bible students. Do you have any reason to believe that Jesus ever used his power for himself? His God power. You know why? He never did. Because we don't have that same capability. And he came to live with us, to be one of us, and to show that by the power of God in us, we can and will live the life that God wants us to live and accomplish the mission and do it in the way that he wants it done. If, God, if, Jesus, if Jesus had performed miracles on his own behalf, he would have disqualified himself. Because we, we would not have access to that in following him and doing that because we are not God. Do you see how that works? So he had to come and be one of us, limit himself to our capabilities as human beings, and do the mission that God asked him to do. And my friends, he asks no less and no more than that of us. I'm going to send you on a mission, Jesus says, and I'm going to give you the same power that I had access to when I was here on earth, the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send, I'm going to send you on the same mission. And actually, I'm going to send you on that mission, and I'm going to send you in the same way that I was sent. You say, Pastor, well, what does that look like? Okay, say... You know, Barry, Barry is, a, is an expert truck driver. Say, I want to get to know truck drivers. I, I think one of the first things I would do would be to get to know Barry. And then say, hey, Barry, I want to I reach out to people who drive truck like you. And he's going to say, well, you, you might have to get your CDL. You, you might have to get your truck driving license. You, you, might have to hang, you might have to actually hang out at the, at the big truck stops. Actually, you might actually have to become a truck driver to really understand truck drivers. Does that, does that make sense to you at all? So if you, if you hear Jesus calling you again this morning and you, you, you're hearing me this pastor dude saying there's two big words that we need to become familiar with. One is mission and the other is incarnation. One is what we're being sent on and the other is how God would like us to do it. Then uh, I'd invite you to, 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 to keep coming on the next few Sabbaths because we're going to start unpacking this and actually uh, uh, there's going to be homework. There's going to be some interesting homework if you're interested in that kind of an approach. We're going to be asking you to go and try certain things in your world. I don't know a lot of your worlds. I don't know where you hang out, what you do with your time. But there are people that you interact with that I'm going to start praying that God will ask you to start interacting with them for him. 
Here's the last phrase I want to leave, leave you with today. It was said to me by a very dear friend of mine, my former conference president in the, the great state of Ohio, Raj Atkin. Yes, he wasn't from Ohio. He was from Sri Lanka, beautiful, beautiful country. But he spent many, many years in the Ohio conference. First as a pastor, then as a conference person, and then finally as, as president. He said, and I don't know if it's original with him, but I, I believe it is, we are called to continue the incarnation. Let me say it again. The call of Jesus Christ today is to continue the incarnation that he was sent on as God. And he has promised that he will live in us. He will direct us. And that as we go about accomplishing the mission that he sends us on, he will show us how to do it. We are called to continue the incarnation of Jesus Christ. This is big. I, I want you to know this is maybe bigger than some are realizing right now, but I, I pray that the Holy Spirit will work upon your hearts and your minds today as you maybe think on these things. Think about what the ramification, that's another big, sorry, big words, I love them, but what are, the, what are the things that will be the fallout if you had to say, look, I'm ready, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to be incarnational in my mission. Got to think about what that means. Because it just may cost you. May want to be ready for those, co those costs. Okay? Thank you for being here today. Thank you for bringing friends. I see a number of new friends with me today, and I am just so happy. I'm also thankful to our musical teams, plural. What Pete does today, he does every second Sabbath, and I thank the people who join him in that. We have a number of teams in this church that do various things on various Sabbaths. It is always such an uplifting experience for me, and I want to thank the guys as they get uh, the, 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 grand, the grand dame, Madame Thornburg, into her place, <laughs> whom, I, whom I love, whom I love. And, 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 and just ask me, uh, how, how, many, how many times have you had someone in your life that has had a stroke and, and, and that still plays the piano and still sings and that it's part of her therapy to come back to us with better qualities of life that she continue to do this? Is that not what church is all about. Yes? Amen. Amen.